This is Dimensions of Prophecy. Welcome, I'm Brenda Wood. Some subjects in the Bible are very, very misunderstood. And because of these misunderstandings, people have problems in their relationship to Scripture and especially to the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Cox's subject tonight is entitled, God's Grand Finale. He'll be dealing with how God wraps everything up at the end of time, how all of it will be cared for. You'll see that God is truly a God of love, mercy, and kindness. You'll understand clearly how he's going to bring everything to a close as he prepares a special place for his people. Let's go directly to the crusade and join Pastor Cox with his thrilling topic from Scripture, God's Grand Finale. Good morning. Enjoy that. Heart music is wonderful, isn't it? Enjoy that very, very much. So, reckon we'll all learn to play a harp? I don't know. But anyhow, we appreciate each of you being here this morning. A young Scottish family had sit, had sit down for breakfast. And in this particular home, it was the custom that the mother would put the food on the table, on, the, on your plate. And when you sat down, you were expected to eat everything that was on your plate. No questions asked. You just cleaned up your plate. And this particular morning, when Johnny sat down at the table, he was hungry. I mean, hungrier than usual. And in no time at all, Johnny had cleaned everything on his plate off. Looked at his mother and said, Mother, I'd like to have some more. And she said, Well, Johnny, you know that if I put it on your plate, you're going to have to eat it. And he said, Yes, Mother. And she said, Well, what would you like? And he said, I'd like to have a little bit of everything, Mother. And so she put a little bit of everything on Johnny's plate. And Johnny started eating, but like little boys... After he had taken a bite or two, he was full up to here. And then Johnny started doing what little boys do, you know, chew one bite for 30 minutes and playing with his food. And uh, she looked at him and said, Johnny, you must clean up your plate. Johnny ate a little bit more. But he wasn't making much progress. And she said, Johnny, you must clean up your plate. And if you don't, you're going to have to go upstairs to your room and God will be very unhappy with you. Johnny ate a little bit more. And she said, now, Johnny, I'm telling you, clean up your plate. And if you don't clean up your plate, you're going to have to go upstairs to your room, and God is very unhappy with little boys that don't clean up their plate. And Johnny, he ate some more. And she said to him, Johnny, I'm telling you for the last time, clean up your plate. And if you don't clean up your plate, you'll have to go upstairs to your room, and God is going to be very, very unhappy with you for not cleaning up your plate. And Johnny finally had it all down but two prunes. But for the life of him, he couldn't eat those two prunes. And she said, okay, Johnny, just get down off your chair and go upstairs to your room, and while you're up there, I want you to think over how unhappy God is with you. And Johnny made his way up to the room, but as he was making his way up to his room, an electrical storm broke out. The old lightning began to flash, and the thunder began to boom, and the wind is blowing, and Johnny's mother got worried, or Johnny's mother got worried about it, and she was concerned about Johnny. And so very carefully she made her way upstairs to his room to see if Johnny was all right. And she opened the door very carefully and looked in to see Johnny standing there at the window looking out at the storm with a very defiant look on his face. And she heard him say, God, why such a great big fuss over two little prunes? And there are a lot of people that all their life they've been taught that that's the kind of God God is. They've been taught that he's there waiting to hit them on top of the head for any wrong move they might make. And today we're going to take a look 
at an area in which many, many people today are not Christians because they are intellectually honest with themselves, because they have been told things they have been told things about God that they cannot put together. Let me give you an example, try to tell you what I'm talking about. For instance, there's a lot of people that have gone to church and they've heard the minister talk about the love of God and they've heard him read texts like this that says, he who does not love does not know God for God is love. Now, that text doesn't say that God is loving. That isn't what it says. It says God is love. That means that he is love personified, that his whole being is love. And so they've heard ministers talk about the love of God and how that he loves us and he died for us, and yet this same minister will tell people, but if you do not accept him, if you don't accept his grace, if you don't accept his pardon, then he's going to send you to hell where he is going to roast you and toast you and burn you for six billion years, and then he's going to turn you over on the other side and roast you for another six billion years. And dear friend, I don't care how you look at that. That doesn't make sense. Just doesn't make sense. And there's a lot of people that have never accepted Christianity because they are intellectually honest with themselves. I don't know how many of you ever heard of a man who was quite renowned as an atheist by the name of Robert Ingersoll. But if you went back and read his life, you would find that Robert Ingersoll studied to be a minister. That's what he studied to be, and they put him with an evangelist. And every night he went and he heard that evangelist preach and that evangelist would end his sermon by saying, making an appeal for people to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And he would end up by saying, but if you don't accept him, that God is going to send you to hell. And he would say that there were little babies in hell not over a span long and their blood ran through their veins like molten lead. Robert Ingersoll took that as long as he could, and one night he walked out and shook his fist into the heavens and said, God, I hate you, and became an atheist. Now, it's important that you and I understand what the Scripture has to say on this subject. Because I can remember I took a magazine once, a religious magazine. I subscribed to it. I got it for two years. It came every week. In the two years, there wasn't a week that went by that there wasn't an article in that magazine on hell. I mean, every week there was an article about hell. And the strange thing about it was, is many of the texts that I find in the Bible that on the subject they never used. And so I'd like for you to find out actually what does the Scripture say about it because that what you believe on the subject affects your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, what you believe definitely has an effect on how you relate to Jesus Christ. And if I believe for one moment that he does some of the things that I find preachers accusing him of, it would affect my relationship with him. So what I'd like for us to find out today is what is the truth about hell? How is God going to wrap it all up? How is he going to bring it to an end? How is that going to take place? That's what we want to find out here. In Acts 3, verse 20, it says, and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. Now listen carefully because he's making a point. Whom heaven must receive until the times of what? Restoration. It says that the heavens must receive Jesus Christ. He went back and they were to receive him till the time of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Can you give me another word for restoration? Huh? To restore. To make it like it was. Yes, to rebuild. Those are all words for restoration. 
Now, if he's going to make the earth like it was in the beginning, he's going to restore it. Do you mean to tell me that there was some place over there where fire billed, billowed up out of hell when God made it to begin with? Is that the way it was? No. In fact, it says this in Revelation, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. You mean to tell me that if I could go and look down into the pits of hell and I could see people burning in hell, maybe people that I knew, that there would be no sorrow, there would be no pain? You better believe there would be. No, it says there won't be any sorrow, there won't be any pain. We need to see what God's talking about. You're saying, Brother Cox, don't you believe in hell? Yes, I believe in hell. I believe hell is a prepared place for unprepared people. But I do not believe in hell as I hear it preached by many today. No, I don't. And I want you to look at some scripture about it. You see, I have some difficulty when you read about Cain and Abel clear back 6,000 years ago and it tells me that because God showed favor towards Abel and accepted his offering that it upset Cain and it says that Cain killed his brother and as best I can tell from the scripture Cain did not walk with the Lord according to the popular theory then Cain has been in hell for some 6,000 years burning and 6,000 years later, along comes a man like Adolf Eichmann that's responsible for the death of thousands and thousands of people. And since he lives 6,000 years later, he gets 6,000 years less punishment. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense at all. So what does it say about it? In the book of Nahum, it says, what do you conspire against the Lord? And that's a real good question. He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a what? Second time. He said, no, affliction's not going to rise up the second time. For while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like what? Stubble fully dried. It says the wicked will be like stubble that is fully dried. And I mentioned the other night, the Bible makes a clear distinction between the righteous and the wicked. When you pick up your Bible, you'll find over and over the Scripture refers to the righteous as gold. That's the way it refers to them, as gold. And it says that we are as gold refined in the fire. That's what fire does to gold. It refines it. It refers to the wicked as what? Stubble. What does fire do to stubble? Okay, I don't know if you've ever seen a stubble field on fire, have you? Boy, I was raised in Oklahoma. You get out in western Oklahoma in the panhandle where they have those huge wheat fields, wheat fields until you can't see the end of them. And they come on in there in the latter part of May 1st of June, and they cut that wheat, and they leave that stubble sticking up about six, eight inches. And boy, it begins to brown in July, and come August, there's no rain, and that stuff is absolutely golden brown, and there's not any moisture in it at all. And you let it get on fire, and you talk about a fire. I mean, it can roll through those fields. You can hear it roar for two miles away when some of those fields are on fire. And I guarantee you, when it's through, there is nothing left. Nothing. It says, the wicked shall be like stubble. Remember that word. We're going to come to it several other times. It says in Psalms, but the wicked shall what? Come on. Perish. Get it clear. The wicked shall perish. Okay? It doesn't say they're going to go on living. It says they shall perish. And the enemy of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadow, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. So it says the wicked are going to perish. 
they're going to vanish into smoke. Now, you won't understand this next picture without some explanation. I understand that. But it's referring to the wicked. It says, they came up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven and what? Devoured them. See, my father was very fond of hunting and fishing. And we spent a lot of time together hunting and fishing, and we always had some dogs, hound dogs. And uh, I grew up having two or three hound dogs around the house, and I'm sorry, I still like hound dogs to this day. Just learned to like them. Well, if you've ever owned a hound dog, you know, and you can pick up a piece of bread and walk out there to the back porch and go, here, Blue, and that old hound dog come trotting up there and you throw him that bread, he doesn't eat it. He devours it. I mean, it's just gone, just like that. That's what it's talking about. It says the wicked will be devoured. It means they're not going to continue to be, going to be wiped out. Listen, in the book of Malachi, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly shall be, come on, stubble, all right, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it will leave them neither root nor branch. So it says the wicked are like stubble, that the fire is going to burn them up. In fact, it goes on and says how well it will do its job. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, saith the Lord of hosts. He says he's going to turn the wicked into ashes. It even says he's going to turn the devil into ashes in the book of Ezekiel. So, dear friends, they're not going to be around. It makes that very clear. In Isaiah, it says, You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels, let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from these things that shall come upon you. Listen carefully. Behold, they shall be stubble. You see, the Scripture uses that word over and over. They shall be stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by nor a fire to set before. It says the fire is going to do its job. It's going to burn them. And then it says that fire is going to go out. There won't be any fire left. There won't even be a coal left to warm at. That's what the Scripture says. Now you're saying, well, <laughs> and there's some Scripture that bother me, some Scripture that kind of sounds a little different than that. Well, let's take a look at some of the Scripture and see what it says. Somebody says, what about in the Bible where it talks about forever? Well, when you and I read the word forever, we just think of it as meaning without end. That's, that's what we think. That isn't always what it means in Scripture. And I'm going to give you several texts that doesn't mean that. It just means until the end of life. That's all it means. Listen. Among the children of Israel... Uh, if they went and fought against another nation and they overthrew that nation, the people were allowed to take prisoners from the nation they had fought and they could take them back to their home and they could work them for seven years as servants. At the end of seven years, they had to give that person their freedom. Okay? Now, I want you to listen because this word forever is involved here very much. In Revelation, listen carefully, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength in the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends, what? Come on, forever and ever. Now, remember that word forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. All right, now there's the word forever. These children of Israel were allowed to take somebody and work them for seven years, but if at the end of seven years that person did not want to leave, they said, I love my master, I love my master's wife, I love my master's children, 
then that man was to do certain things. And this is what the scripture says he was to do. Then his master shall bring him to the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him, what? Forever. Now, it just simply says that if that man said, listen, I don't want to leave, I like it here, I love my wife, I, I love my master, I love my master's wife, I love the children, I don't want to leave. Then he was to pierce his ear, and he was to serve him how long? Forever. How long did that mean? Till he died. Simply what it means, that word in Greek is agon, and it means until the end of the age. Let's take another example. You remember a man in the Bible by the name of Samuel? Samuel's mother, do you remember her name? Hannah? You remember she never had any children. And one day she was at the temple praying. And Eli saw her, and he told her that God was going to give her a son, which God did. And out of gratitude, because the Lord had given her this son, this is what happened. But Hannah did not go up, for, the Lord, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. How long did that mean? Well, it just meant as long as he lived, rest of his life. And that's exactly what happened. She took him, gave him to Eli. He worked there in the temple and became a follower of the Lord and worked there the rest of his life. Do you remember a man in the Bible by the name of Jonah? Huh? You remember Jonah? And you remember he got up, went down to Joppa and caught that ship for Tarshish? Huh? And you remember he got thrown overboard. You remember that? Swallowed by a whale. How long was Jonah in the belly of that whale? How long? Three days and three nights. Would you like to see how long Jonah says he was there? This is what Jonah says. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. That's the very bottom. The earth with, it, with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. I'm sure that three days and three nights in the belly of a whale is the closest thing to forever you'll ever find. I'm sure of that. But it just meant until the end of the age, and that's what that text is saying that they're going to be done away with. It doesn't mean to continue on and on and on. All right, other people say, but Brother Cox, what about in the Scripture where it talks about eternal fire? Eternal fire. Well, let's read the Scripture about it. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to what? Eternal condemnation. All right, now, I'd like to explain the difference because what people mix up in the study of Scripture is two words. They mix up the difference between punishing and punishment. They mix up those two things. You see, the punishing is not eternal. The punishment is eternal. They're never coming back. They're going to be destroyed. They'll never come back. That does not mean that they're going to be continually punished. Doesn't mean that. So when it talks about eternal condemnation, it talks about eternal fire, it's saying the punishment is eternal, not the punishing. Let me give you an example. You remember in the Bible, a man by the name of Lot? Remember him? And you remember that God finally had to send an angel, and the angel had to take Lot and his wife and two daughters and lead them out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then Lot's wife turned back and became a pillar of salt. The Scripture picks that up and uses it as an example of the punishment of the wicked. Okay? Listen carefully. 
as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. So it says they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Okay, listen to what Peter says about it. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly. Now he says the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah suffered eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah burning today? Huh? Would you like to see where Sodom and Gomorrah is? Well, this happens to be a picture of the Dead Sea up here in the top left-hand corner of the screen. If you look at it carefully, this is the Dead Sea. Sodom and Gomorrah is at the lower end of the Dead Sea under about three foot of water. Certainly is not burning today. But they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. It means they're never coming back. They were destroyed. The punishment was eternal. The punishing is not. Okay? It makes a great, great difference. But somebody says, yes, but the Scripture talks about unquenchable fire. Burn it with an unquenchable fire. Let's read the Scripture. John answered and said to them, saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, I'll tell you, folks, I don't understand. I hear them say that God's going to take some people and throw them into a place where he's going to burn them with unquenchable fire. In fact, you've read, you've read the text, haven't you? Where it says that if your eye offends you, it's much better that you pluck out your eye and to enter into heaven with one eye than into hell with both eyes where the fire is not quenched and the, the worm dieth not. Haven't you ever read that? If your hand offends you, cut it off. It's much better to enter into, hell with one, into heaven with one hand than into hell with both where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. And I've had them tell me that that meant that people were going to be thrown into hell and they were going to burn on and on through eternity and worms were going to eat on them for six billion years and get nowhere. I have a little trouble with that. That place referred to there in Scripture was the word Gehenna. Gehenna is a place outside of Jerusalem where they burnt dead animals. If an animal died, they threw it in Gehenna. What the fire didn't burn up the worms ate. It meant total destruction. That's what it meant. It didn't mean they were going to go on and on and never come to an end. just doesn't mean that. The Bible gives you a perfect example of it here. Listen. Jeremiah 17, 27. But if you will not he heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Okay, they did not heed. They did not listen. This is what happened. Now in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which, is, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great men, he burned with fire. They could not quench it. 
It's exactly God said it would not be quenched and it was not quenched. When it says he will burn them with unquenchable fire, that does not mean that God is going to start a fire so big that God can't put it out. It means that man can't quench it. But God certainly can quench it. Exactly what it means. All right, let's look at another one. One that I have a lot of people ask questions about, and that's the rich man and Lazarus. Always comes up. The rich man and Lazarus. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the whole story of the rich man and Lazarus to you without comment. I'm just going to go through and read it without comment. I just want to say to you before I do, be careful. Because you have been programmed. You've been programmed to read something into that story that it doesn't say. So watch carefully as I read it. Luke, the 16th chapter. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those who want to come from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now, I need to ask you a question or two. Is there any place in that story where it said that that rich man was going to burn forever? It's not there. It's not there. People read that story and read that into it. It doesn't say that. It says the rich man was in torment. But it does not say that he is going to burn forever. No, it doesn't say that. This is a parable. And I have people say, oh, Brother Cox, no, that's not a parable. That happened just exactly like it says there. I had a man one time after a meeting come up and tell me that. He said, no, he said, that's not a parable. It happened just like it says right there. And I said, just like it says. And he said, just like it says. And I said, when Lazarus died, where did he go? He said, oh, he went to heaven. I said, that isn't what it says. He said, it says that he went to Abraham's bosom. Are you going to get all the saved in Abraham's bosom? He said, well, no, that's not what it means. And that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. It's a parable. You've got to understand what it means. What's it mean? Well, you see, Jesus is trying to straighten out some of their thinking. The Jewish people believe that if you are a child of Abraham, you can't miss heaven. That's why this Jew, this rich Jew, is looking up and yelling, Father Abraham. He's saying, Father Abraham, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. 
Secondly, the Jewish people believed that if you were rich, it was a sign that you were blessed by God. If you were poor, it was a sign that you were cursed. So Christ took a rich Jew, turned the tables on him, took a rich Jew and put him in torment. He takes a man that the dogs, you see, they believe that if you're not a Jew, if you were a Gentile, you were a dog. And so he takes a man that the dogs lick his sores and that he's poor and above all things puts him in Abraham's bosom. And that's what he's trying to get across. He's trying to get across to those people just because they are children of Abraham doesn't give them a right to heaven. Just because you're a member of a church doesn't give you a right to heaven. You better know Jesus Christ. You better know him personally. Are you going to miss it? Great, great difference. Now, if you're having trouble believing this is a parable, I can tell you for sure, if it was an actual situation, that rich man wouldn't have been asking for Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. He would have been asking for a bucket full, I can assure you. But Jesus makes it very clear that it's a parable. Listen. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, Without a parable, he did not speak to them. When Jesus was teaching the people, he taught them in parables. Without a parable, he didn't talk to them. Now, I'm going to tell you a parable that Jesus told. After I've told you the parable, we're going to come back and let Christ interpret it. He told about a farmer. He said this farmer had... A nice farm. He went out and he very carefully prepared the soil. Plowed the ground, harrowed the ground. After he got the field all the done, the ground was all just right. Then it said he sowed his field, sowed it with grain. And after he had sowed his field, he went home and waited for the seed to come up. After a few days, his servants come running in all excited. And they said, Master, Master, when you, sowed good, when you sowed the field, didn't you use good seed? He said, Yes, I used good seed. Why? Because they said the whole field is full of tares, weeds. He said the whole field's full of weeds. And he said, Ah, oh, an enemy's done this to us. While we were asleep, the enemy came and sowed weeds or tares in our field. And the servant said, well, do you want us to go and pull them up? And he said, no, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the end. Then we'll separate the weed and the wheat, the weeds and the wheat, and we'll toss the weeds in the fire to be burned. After the multitude left, Jesus' disciples came to him and said, we don't understand what you're saying. We don't understand that. And so Jesus explains it to them. This is what he said. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Let's get that real clear. Okay, the one that sows good seed is Jesus Christ. All right? The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. That's the righteous. But the tares or the weeds are the sons of the wicked ones. So that the tares or the weeds are the wicked. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the Angels. Okay, we've got all the principal characters, right? That's what it says. So, this is simply what it's saying. 
Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Let me ask you, how many people are in hell now? Zero. Nobody. Nobody in hell now. So it will be at the end of the age. At the end, the wicked are going to be destroyed. Oh, yes, the Scripture makes that very clear. Oh, don't misunderstand me. There's a hell. And the wicked are going to burn. In fact, the Scripture even says that some are going to burn longer than others. Not on the basis that you think. You see, most of you think that the wicked are going to burn based on how bad they were, right? No, uh-uh. They're going to burn based on what they knew. That's what it says. To he who much has been given, much will be required. In other words, if you know a lot, if you know the gospel, if you knew Jesus Christ, if you know that which is right and you don't do it, that person's going to burn longer. Not the person whose sins are so bad, but based on what you know. Some will burn longer than others. But the fire's going to go out. It's going to come to an end. That the Scripture promises. In fact, it says this. It says that the earth is going to burn in 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens being on fire will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat. No, it says he's going to take this old earth and he's just going to burn it. All the elements will melt fervent heat. All the wicked will be destroyed. They're not going to be anymore. Then it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. After it's been burned, then you're going to find that the Lord Jesus Christ is simply going to take this old earth and he's going to make it brand new. Make it like it once was. Restoration. It will become the home of all of God's people because it says, Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the what? The earth. Yes, this is going to be God's home for his people. And this is where they're going to dwell. What I'm trying to get across to you is God loves you. God's not a sadist, folks. God's not sitting there hitting people on top of the head. He's doing everything he can to get everybody into the kingdom. He wants you to be there. He wants you to be saved. Oh, sure, there's a heaven to win and a hell to shun. Indeed, there is. But, dear friends, he wants men and women in heaven because they love him, not because they're afraid of hell but because they love the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. I want you to listen as Steve sings the love of God. While they're doing that, I'll make a few announcements. To begin with, Kurt mentioned to you, at 11 o'clock today, our subject will be the Antichrist as prophesied in the Bible. Now, my advice to you is that you just kind of have someone save your seat and go get a drink and you come right back because Pastor Dan's going to be preaching in the next service and I don't think you want to miss that. 
And then at 11 o'clock, the best preparation I can give you for tomorrow night's subject on the Mark of the Beast is 11 o'clock today. And then tonight, our subject is the object of the devil's attack. We're going to be talking about something that the Antichrist and the devil have been trying to do away with. So we hope that you will be back again tonight. Also, starting tomorrow night, starting tomorrow evening, we will begin at the close of the service a five-day plan for all those that need help with tobacco, alcohol, or drugs. That's Sunday evening, right after the first, after the service in the evening, we will have a five-day plan. If you need help with tobacco, alcohol, or drugs, then we hope that you will stay by for that. Sunday night, we have several things that we're going to be doing, so we hope that you'll be here as we talk about the subject, the mark of the beast. Do you need a ticket to get in Sunday night for the mark of the beast? If you have a ticket, that ticket is for you, for no one else. Okay? I want that made clear. I do that on purpose. I don't make any apologies for it. I believe the subject on the mark of the beast needs a certain amount of background. And therefore, we give those tickets to people we feel have enough background to understand the subject. If you go and give it to somebody that doesn't have that background, then you're not doing them a favor. Okay? So that ticket is for you, and I hope you, you will just use it yourself and no one else. We'll look for you at 11 o'clock. We hope you'll stay by at, t at 9.45 here. I think we'll just have a good time worshiping the Lord today. Okay? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for the love of God, for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you'll bless each one here as they worship thee today. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good Sabbath.